Hi everyone, my name is Jackie with SMNP Reviews, and today we're going to discuss alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. That may or may not sound familiar to you, but by understanding these receptors, it can unlock a better understanding of pharmacologic drug classes. We will talk about the nervous system, how these receptors work, and how different medications work on them. And we'll finish off with a practice question to pull it all together. So let's get started. Before we get too deep into alpha and beta adrenergic receptors, we need to go over some basics of the nervous system. And do you remember the two main divisions of the nervous system? The nervous system can be divided into the central nervous system, which is made up of the brain and spinal cord, and then the peripheral nervous system, which includes all of the other nerves, like the cranial nerves, spinal nerves, and peripheral nerves. The peripheral nervous system is broken down into the autonomic and somatic nervous systems. I remember those by thinking that the autonomic nervous system is about all of our automatic functions, like breathing and our heart rate, where the somatic nervous system controls our voluntary movements. Within the autonomic nervous system, we have the sympathetic side and the parasympathetic side. The sympathetic nervous system controls our fight or flight response and is controlled by the main neurotransmitters of epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. The parasympathetic nervous system controls rest and digest functions under the control of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. To understand alpha and beta adrenergic receptors, we're going to focus a little bit more on the sympathetic nervous system. Adrenergic receptors bind mostly with epinephrine and norepinephrine. Dopamine can bind with adrenergic receptors, but also has specific dopamine receptors. And then acetylcholine in the parasympathetic nervous system binds with muscarinic receptors. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine are types of neurotransmitters called catecholamines. More on catecholamines in a minute. Certain medications act on adrenergic receptors to either mimic or block the actions of epinephrine and norepinephrine. So a little bit more about catecholamines, specifically epinephrine and norepinephrine. They are produced by the adrenal gland and once in the bloodstream, they bind to alpha and beta receptors that cause several actions. Increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, increased respiratory rate, and dilate the bronchioles, increase in mental alertness and dilate pupils, increase in muscle strength and energy, and that's done by increasing glucose and fatty acid release for energy, and slow down of digestion. This fight or flight response prepares our body to perform under stress. Think of it this way. If we were in a life or death situation where we either needed the energy to run away or fight back, it would be super important to have increased blood flow to our skeletal muscles, coupled with the energy of adrenaline and extra glucose. And that's what the catecholamines do. Okay, so now let's get to the receptors that the catecholamines, epinephrine, and norepinephrine bind to. The four main adrenergic receptors are alpha-1 and alpha-2, beta-1 and beta-2. So let's talk about where these receptors are located so that we can better understand the medications that work on them. Alpha-1 receptors are mostly found in the vascular smooth muscle, the eyes, and sphincters in the gastrointestinal and genitourinary symptoms, and when activated, causes vasoconstriction, pupillary dilation, and sphincter contraction. Alpha-2 receptors are located on presynaptic nerve terminals throughout the body, and when bound to, inhibits more epinephrine from being released. So activation of those receptors can lead to decreased blood pressure. Beta-1 receptors are mainly located in the heart and kidneys. Activation of those receptors will increase heart rate, cardiac output, and blood pressure. Beta-2 receptors are widely distributed with some locations including the eyes, blood vessels, lungs, liver, pancreas, and GIGU systems. Activation of beta-2 receptors leads to smooth muscle relaxation, resulting in such actions as bronchodilation, slow digestion, and decreased urination, vasodilation, and also increased glucose production. To note, there are also beta-3 receptors, 
but they are the least studied type of beta receptors. They are most commonly found in fat and the bladder, and activation of beta-3 receptors causes relaxation of the detrusor muscle in the bladder, leading to less frequent urination. So as you can see, depending on the location of the receptor and whether the receptor has more of an excitation or relaxation response determines the physiologic response. For example, the alpha-1 receptors in the skin leads to vasoconstriction of blood supply to the skin, as that's not really super important during a fight or flight response. But beta-2 receptors in the lungs leads to bronchodilation, which is a necessity in a stress response. Let's go over how medications work on these different receptors. First, an agonist means that it activates the receptor, where an antagonist blocks the action of the receptor. Also, some medications are more selective than others. That means that certain medications can only activate or block receptors in a particular location, such as just the lungs or the prostate or the heart. Activation of alpha-1 receptors typically leads to vasoconstriction in certain areas of the body. Examples of a common selective alpha-1 agonist is phenylephrine, or Sudafed, and oxymetazoline, or afrin, nasal spray, which are helpful in the treatment of nasal congestion. And remember that activation of alpha-2 receptors leads to vasodilation. Selective alpha-2 agonists include clonidine, catapress, and methyl dopa used for the treatment of hypertension. So, now these alpha adrenergic antagonists will block the effects of the receptors. Alpha-1 antagonists, or blockers, as you may hear them referred to, most commonly include medications to treat BPH, which are selective to the receptors in the prostate. There is also a medication called doxazosin, which can also be used to treat BPH and hypertension, a two for one. There are also some older medications that act partially as alpha-2 antagonists, but in fact, there are no FDA-approved drugs that are selective alpha-2 antagonists. The most common selective beta-1 agonist is dobutamine. Dobutamine increases cardiac contractility to treat heart failure when a patient is severely decompensated. It is given only by IV injection, and so it's not something we will ever prescribe as primary care nurse practitioners. Now, beta-2 receptors are located all over, but let's focus on the most common medication class of beta-2 agonists, the bronchodilators. These would be considered selective beta-2 agonists because they focus on the receptors in the lungs, like the bronchodilator albuterol, and are definitely something we can prescribe. These medications are used to treat respiratory conditions that cause airway constriction, like asthma and COPD. These medications also come in short and long-acting formulations. And we briefly talked about beta-3 receptors, and the most common medication that you will encounter in primary care that affects the beta-3 receptors is Mirbegron, or Mirbetric. That medication is used to treat overactive bladder symptoms, and it works because activation of those beta-3 receptors relaxes the detrusor muscle, leading to decreased urinary frequency. The last group of antagonists, or blockers, are the beta blockers. Specifically, these are beta-1 blockers, as there are no FDA-approved selective beta-2 or 3 receptor blockers. Remember, Activation of the beta-1 receptors leads to increased heart rate and blood pressure. So beta-1 antagonists therefore block those receptors and lead to decreased heart rate and blood pressure. Beta blockers are used in the management of hypertension and typically end in OLOL. Some of these are more cardioselective than others, meaning they can work more specifically on the beta-1 receptors in the heart. The most cardioselective beta-1 blockers include atenolol or tenormin and metoprolol or low pressor. Let's bring together what we learned and do a practice question. A 47-year-old patient with diabetes is being started on propranolol or hermangiol for migraine therapy. Which of the following statements by the nurse practitioner indicates correct patient education? Remember to monitor your blood sugar levels more closely. 
This medication may cause palpitations. This medication will likely decrease your appetite and cause weight loss. Or you may experience increased urinary frequency. The correct answer is A. Remember to monitor your blood sugar levels more closely. Beta blockers used in the management of conditions such as hypertension, heart failure, and migraines can mask the symptoms of hypoglycemia. The effects of beta blockers include a slower heart rate and reduced palpitations, decreased tremor, decreased sweating, and decreased restlessness, which are all intended effects. However, those effects are often the first warning signs to a patient with diabetes that their blood sugar is dropping. So patients with diabetes who take beta blockers need to be more consistent in their blood sugar monitoring since symptoms of hypoglycemia may not present until their blood sugar is dangerously low. B is incorrect because propranolol is also used to reduce palpitations, and a side effect is increased appetite leading to potential weight gain. So C is also incorrect. D is incorrect because as a beta adrenergic antagonist, there is no effect on the urinary system, so increased urinary frequency is not related to, to propranolol use. I hope you found this review helpful and that you feel more confident in understanding alpha and beta receptors. Make sure you subscribe to our channel so you see our latest videos, and we will see you next time. Happy studying!